Uh, I might as well start with the story of why I even started with them. 31 years ago, come April 15th, my wife said she would like to have a wooden egg for our anniversary, which fell on Easter. So, like normal, in one ear and out the other. So, Easter and our anniversary came around. I gave her her anniversary present and a card and candy, whatever, pa. No egg. She never said a word, but I could see she was upset. <laughs> anyway, she went out into the living room to take and uh, get a dress or iron a dress or go to church, and she looked down alongside the sofa, and there laid an egg. It was like a little kid. <laughs> so I said, well, you better find the rest of them. And I had hid 13 of them around the house, different kinds of wood. And I didn't realize the monster that I created. <laughs> Is that Cindy? <laughs> no. But anyway, uh, right now we have in our own collection somewhere between 300 and 350 eggs of different species. Uh, wherever I went, I got a, a different piece of wood. Uh, when I was in Australia the first time, uh, I got some, and the people found out I was looking for eggs. And the second time I went back there, they came with armloads. Uh, so that year I, I made 101 eggs for Easter. But anyway, this has evolved into children, you know, my children, and uh, mother-in-law who is no longer with us, and my mother who is no longer with us. But it would, it would be 35, 40 eggs every year for, for Easter, which it still ends up somewhere 25, 30 eggs. Um, I learned one thing over the years that you want to take and do the best you can with an egg. My daughter had a collection, and after uh, I started doing these, I got to where I didn't remember what the wood was. So I had to start identifying the wood. I didn't. I never wanted to put a, a name or anything on the egg. I thought it was bad, but it got to the point to where I had to do something. So my daughter gave me her eggs, and she says, "Dad, would you uh, identify mine?" I says, "Sure." I got this one piece of maple that looked like if a chicken had laid it, it would have done severe damage. <laughs> <laughs> So I says, honey, how about if I take and, and uh, give you a new egg? And she says, not on a pet. She says, I got that one. I could have walked underneath that blade. She says, and I'm not getting rid of it. So from then on, I started doing what I could to make sure that I made nice eggs. Okay, um, when I do my eggs, there's two things that I never liked about them when I saw other people doing them. One of them was normally the ends of the egg were burnished where people would go push down too hard when they were trying to cut it off because they didn't leave themselves enough room. And the second was when they cut that off, sometimes they pulled the grain out and they would leave a, a hole where the grain had been pulled out. Those two things really upset me, and I didn't like them, so that's why I go the way that I do now. I use a chuck made out of PVC pipe. <clears throat> um, what I do is I take inch and a half pipe, and I put a piece of regular pipe inside the fitting. This is a coupler. On the one side, it goes all the way to the ridge that's in the, in the center of it. On the other side, I only go in about, oh, half inch. Okay, the reason I do that, so that I could take and have a place to take and make a regular pipe inside the fitting. This is a coupler. 
on the one side, it goes all the way to the ridge that's in the, in the center of it. On the other side, I only go in about, oh, half inch. Okay, the reason I do that, so that I could take and have a place to take and make a, a, a grab for my chuck, I go on the inside of the chuck. Why? I thought it looked nice, it was clean. Uh, you, there's nothing wrong with going on the outside. I just like everything clean and easy on the inside. Um, and the other part uh, that goes halfway through, that I take in, have to open it up a little bit, and I make a concave in there. And that is for, if, it, if you put straight with that egg, you would only contact it in one spot. If you have a concave, you're contacting it on two spots and it holds it. Otherwise, it would dance around on you, and if you could even line it up right. I have a, a jig that I made. I indicate through my lathe normally eight holes. Um, I've tried it with six, but I think eight works better because there's more flexibility in it. So when you go to drill this, I, I just go to my drill press and I clamp it down, find my center, and uh, I've already got them all laid out. So when you drill one, if it's top dead center, the other one's bottom dead center, so you can drill all the way through. And I do use a one half Forstner bit. Uh, I have tried other ones, especially like a 135 degree bit will tear you up. Uh, I'm sure you've most of you have done pens. And if you take and, and uh, drill with a 135 degree bit and you don't have it clamped down, when it breaks through, it climbs right up on the drill. The reason for that is that when it goes through, it hasn't had time to make a complete revolution which would make the hole the right size so it just jams and goes up that drill like it was a nut on a bolt. So if you do pens, you want to make sure they're locked down so that when you do that, it, it can't climb the drill. And the same would go with this, only I've never found where I could do that because you're, you're breaking out on the other side uh, with the point and it just doesn't work. So a force and a bit is what you want. Once I've got that all done and I've made my grooves for my clamps, and yes, I put a groove in there so that it kind of contains them. Uh, when you go to put your egg in there, sometimes you got two hands working and you want something that you can take and uh, keep where you can get at it. Then I go to my bandsaw, and the other half of my jig is now Uh, I put a, a one-half dowel in there, half-inch dowel, and that slips right on there. And yes, I have left a little bit of room at the back so I don't trap it. And it was the, actually the, the center here that uh, is made for doing the other way. It's my stop. So, but this way, I go to the bandsaw and set it up right down the middle with my fence and then make my cut and when you break through the hole you're done. Now that sounds very simple except when you start the next one. Now you've got a couple fingers that are starting to get loose so you want to really take and hold them. I don't know of any other way other than just holding them. I, I run a 3 16ths 12 blade in my bandsaw so it cuts pretty smooth. Now I just continue going around until I've cut all four. One main thing you want to do is make sure that you cut these fingers and not these fingers. 
I'll pass that around and you can take a look at it. I'm sure you'd like to see some eggs. Would you would you grab hold of this? When I go, some, sometimes people say, well, I've got a piece of this or that. What size do you want? Two by two by three. I don't need three inches for length, but nine times out of ten, you're going to have a crack. You're going to have something. And that way it allows you to shift your egg one way or the other so that you can take and have a solid egg. Normally, I, I think this is pretty close to uh, an inch and five eighths, a little over. <clears throat> All depends what you want. There's, there's nothing wrong with leaving it long. I use a, a cone center in my uh, headstock, and I have one also in my tailstock. Now, this sometimes will slip on you a little bit, but the reason that I use that, rather than saying, uh, uh, what's the one with the teeth on it? Yeah. yeah. Now, these two match each other, and when I go to take and finish the egg off, this end always works good, but that end, when I turn it around, will fit this again. So I've got both ends that are uniform for setting up. What I've got here is a, a piece of olive. I don't care what lathe you go to, you're going to have a certain amount of play in that tail stock. Now, I can see, I can move it back and forth about a sixteenth of an inch, but by doing it like this, right now it has centered itself the best it can. Now I'll lock that down. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Anytime you do anything between centers, spindles, whatever, it's a good way of doing it. As long as I'm doing this, I'm going to show you one of my things that I really like. You're traveling with your tools. You know, people just throw them in a bag or whatever. I make a sheath for mine. It's very simple. I take a, normally I, I use a piece of wood, and I'll say a dowel, like this one's a half inch. And I'll, I'll take and I'll wrap that dowel in a piece of wax paper. Just one or two wraps. Then I'll take a sheet of brown paper and lay it down and I'll take regular wood glue and I'll dilute it quite a bit with water and I'll paint both sides of that. Then I'll wrap that up in uh, glued up brown paper as tight as I can wrap it. And then I'll set it aside and let it dry. The reason I put the wax paper on there, after the glue is on there, I can pull that tube out. <laughs> if you didn't do that, I don't know what you would do. Then I trim it the length, and then I take and put some heat shrink tubing over it. Why? Because I like the looks of it. It makes it a nice looking and solid 
she, they've been all over and they still end up nice. I like to use a spindle roughing gouge, and I do mean a spindle roughing gouge if you think you're going to use that on a bowl. No, no. so fast it looked like it was still going. <laughs> Guys, I should have looked at this beforehand. What did they say? Hindsight 2020. Anyone have smaller hands? I did turn the speed down. <coughs> Should have done that right off the bat. When I first started doing these eggs, I decided that I wanted them to be a hen's size egg. So I went to the refrigerator and I got what I thought looked like a nice egg. And I made a template. Now, I rarely use this <coughs> template to check the egg. Uh, that I do by eye. But it sets my parameters. In other words, we got one spot here that's, there you can see it now. Uh, the one spot is the largest diameter. There's always one spot that's larger than anywhere else on that egg. And the width or the length. Now, these, when I make these out of, um, Home Depot, Menards, a lot of those places have the little samples for um, countertop materials and stuff. So they make very nice little templates or I can check, you know, by lying it or squaring those all up. I got a short little square that I can use, but I'd go in there and, you know, oh, that one looks nice. Well, maybe that one for the bathroom. And Cindy might like that. I used to be welcome at Home Depot. <laughs> so in other words, what this is going to do is set my parameters.
<clears throat> the center of the largest diameter is an inch and three quarter. And I got a little tool here I won last week or, or last month at the um, raffle. Pardon me. No problem. I just want to do that if that's okay with you. No problem. See? I can turn it off if it would be better. That's even better. Okay, this little thing is, is quite nice, I thought. Go up an inch and three quarter and set your outside calipers. Where did you say you got that? I won it at the raffle last, last month at the other club. You know, <laughs> I'll have to say, I looked at that and I said, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> and I've used it like you can't believe. If you if you flip it over, you can take it something round and you know make make your find your center with it. So it actually works quite nice. It's got a Rockler brand on it. Yes, it does. Now, do you hear how much different this one's running yeah. than, than the other one? Yeah. Because yeah. this was loose. But when I went this one, everything lined up differently than, so I mean, it, it made a whole different uh, cutting action here. Thing says, well, put it in a raffle. So we put it in a raffle, and those two women fought over that egg and paid $110 for that egg. <laughs> ben Poe was there, and he looked at me and he says, I think I'm going to start making eggs. <laughs> I think an egg is the hardest shape to make. I really do. I don't think there's anything any more difficult to make than the form of an egg. Now, when I look at that, I, I guess I could take my template and go, but when I look at that, I can see right there, that's not right.
Now I'm going to do a little shear scraping on it. And all I do is go back and forth and just kind of let my eye do the, the work. And I haven't made any of these in the last few days. But when I'm in my mood, or my mode of going, yes? Did you remember the statement from the, from the banjo? You can use the definition. It's all fuzzy on the ukulele. So you get more contrast. You get more contrast with the on the banjo. Oh, okay. I see what you're yeah, saying. Now you got the white surface. You got the surface on it. Yeah. Okay. And Thanks. Yes. Not a problem. So that's really not too bad. If I was to say there was any place that I don't care for, it is right there. Better. Won't get in trouble doing any sand and blowing, as long as I don't do a lot of it. Okay. Normally, I do not like cloth sanding, but at this, I do. For the simple reason, this will kind of conform to the shape and bridge over the high spots and miss the low spots and even everything out. Why don't you like, normally, why don't you like cloth? I like, I like regular paper, which I will use. Yeah. This is the one step that I do use this. Shape it. Is that J-Flex? Uh, I don't know what the name of it is. I get it from Lee Valley. Okay, so that's they the call it same wood type of wood turners. Yeah, same type paper. of product. <coughs> this is 240. Pretty flexible. Yeah, it does a nice job. Now I go to my paper. When I buy my my paper, they're what uh, nine by eleven. I cut it into thirds, the long way, and then cut it in half. And I get these, and all I have to do is fold it in half, and it makes a padded um, sanding. And when this gets loaded up, all I have to do is. Got a clean piece, but you can only do that once because <laughs> you mess that side up too. This is one eighty. Sands different than what paper does. Who asked that? Yeah, cloth, cloth like that sands differently than what paper does. It leaves different scratches in there than, than what the paper will. That 
was 320. This is 400. shouldn't say that I don't do that. Um, at times, especially doing pens, before I finish them, if it's porous and I have sanding dust in there, I will take acetone and a paper towel and clean it. Or sometimes I'll even take the shop back and turn it with that. But it all depends on what the wood is and what I'm doing with it. If I'm putting a finish on, like say with glue boost, uh, that stuff is so clear that you better make sure what you've got down here is clean because it shows everything underneath. At times I've had stuff <coughs> where I look at it and I say I got sanding scratches in it, but I don't. But it shows up. The grain of the wood is so clear that you sometimes think you have sanding scratches and you really don't. This is still 600, but this is kind of a foam back. Uh, Vince's Woodwork, I'm sure most of the guys have, have seen that stuff. I think it's pretty good. I don't use it all the time. I'd rather have what I just used. Now, I don't care how good you are, you're never going to get all the concentric scratches out. So I always go back the long way and make sure I don't have any. paper towel around here? Or a couple of them, please. Toilet paper do? That'll do. Not really. paper that it was telling you. hurt themselves with an electric dryer. Uh -huh. <laughs> Your undershirt will work. <laughs> no, it won't. I'm sure you've all heard of Julio Marcolongo. He's an Australian turner. Good guy. Good turner. He was doing a demo and he did a box and he didn't have any paper towels or anything, so he took his shirt off, his undershirt. Thank you. And, which he shouldn't have done, but he took the corner of it and it caught and went around and threw the piece up in the air and he caught it and he says, and that's how you take it off the way. <laughs> Okay, this, this paper that I really like is called Thin Cat. Thin Cat, F-I-N-K-A-T. And the only place I've seen it is craft supplies. And it just does, to me, it's really good. First time I used it, I took all the sandpaper that I had and sold it to a friend. <laughs> he was, he was at one time. <laughs> I, I, I can get it from uh, 180, 240, 320, 400, 600. What, what is it about the thin cat that you like where it's sharper? It, it cuts so nice and it doesn't leave a lot of scratches. Okay. I can't tell you. It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you, actually. You tell me if you kill me? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't kill you. I'm a peace-loving man. <laughs> Much more when I was younger. <laughs> um, what it is is depth, straight out of the can. Uh, 
it's a, it's a lacquer based like a brushing lacquer. I'm sure everybody has probably tried it at some time, right? If you haven't, you should. Yes, Ace has it normally. Who? Okay. You're not a farmer. What are you doing in there? I still own a car. It's hard to break old habits. Isn't it? about it right now it's dry that fast of course the, the friction is what dries it <coughs> okay we've got ourselves the better part of an egg What I'll do is just line that up. Now, at home, I know where my lathe is as far as the tailstock, so I'll push it in that direction so that it's uh, solid. This one, I'm, ga I'm gambling on it. No, 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 I'm talking about the play in it. Yeah, the, the play. Right. Okay, now, I missed it. You know, I said I, I went where I thought it was. Folks, do the same thing with your tail stocks. Let it run first. Let it, let it seek its center. I haven't before, but that's going to save me a lot of time in the future. Yes, it will. Believe me. Glenn Lucas was in my shop one day, and I did that. And he just looked at me and never thought of it. I don't tighten them as probably as tight as you think. Uh, for the simple reason, if you tighten them up on some woods, you get the marks from the chuck. No, I, I meant on your hand. Oh, no, 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 no. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about okay. right now. Number one, you always want to make sure that it's free. Number two, you want to keep your hands out of it. <laughs> now, there's nothing that says you couldn't put a big rubber band around it or even just a piece of tape on here so that when you go up, get close to it, that tape will slap you and wake you up. One thing I've seen people use is tennis sweatpants for your wrists. Yes. They're cherry cloth and stretchy and they'll fit right over that and snug down and it'll just be a soft bump. Yeah. You know, anything to break it, you know, but uh, or you can do what I do and pay attention to it. I'll be 80 years old. And all my life, I thought skin 
thin skin meant that a deep person, you know, couldn't take a joke or anything like that. I'm learning what thin skin really means. <laughs> Okay, what I've done now, <clears throat> I've cut that off enough. I got oh, a good eighth of an inch here that I can take and move it back. And the reason I did that was if I cut it too close, there's nothing says I still couldn't have pulled a grain out of that. So I can go in there now and, and finish this off. This, this is my scraper. Looks very much like a, a regular skew, and I use it for a skew at times. How's that? Okay, it, it's just that I've, I've shaped it a little differently, that I have a round edge on it, uh, much more than a skew, although I do use it as a skew quite often. Now, how I develop this, you know I do inlays. I, I really and do enjoy doing inlays, and I do quite a few of them. I was at a point to where I would go and try and clean off my inlays to make them uniform, and they always seemed to, not always, but most of the time, you couldn't get them all flat, all the same <laughs> surface, sanding them, nothing. So I standing one day and I said, well, why don't I make a really sharp one? So if you look at this, if that's 90 degrees to what your, your uh, shaping but look where my handle is and it looks like I'm going to kill myself when I go in and scrape with that rather than being at a 90 degree but this is not meant to take a lot of material off it's meant to take a little and the other thing that I use it for I leave a burr on it if I'm going to be going this way this is the last surface that I grind, and it throws that burr up a little bit. But this, if I had tried to take this angle and run that all the way out, it would be so brittle and thin out here that it would just snap off immediately. So by doing it this way, I've got the strength, I've got, I got the best of both worlds. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Be a few come back and ask me after the meeting. I'm sure. So it's not a knife edge on there. Yes, it is. But I left the burr. Yeah, you would. You wouldn't want to lay your fingers on this. It's it's sharp. And again, this is just by eye. <coughs> what I'm feeling, you can actually feel where I stopped scraping and back to the other one so I'm, I'm making sure that there's no step there. If you had done this between centers and cut it off all the way, 
a lot of times you get burnished on the ends of this. And when that happens, you know, you just can't hardly sand it out. It just <coughs> becomes very obstinate. I was down to Raleigh, and one of my good friends was in my demo. And I asked him later, I says, uh, how'd you like it? He says, uh, disappointed. I said, really, what did I do wrong? He says, you never told a joke. <laughs> so I'll try and rectify that a little bit. Woman woke up in the middle of the night and her husband wasn't in bed. So she went looking for him, goes out in the kitchen. There, sitting by the window at the kitchen table, a cup of coffee in his hand, a touch of a tear in the corner of his eye. She says, honey, what's the matter? He says, nothing, I was just thinking. Well, what were you thinking about? Well, remember when you were 16 and we first started dating? She says, sure. Remember the night in the back seat of my Chevy? She says, how could I forget? Remember your daddy putting that shotgun up against my head and saying, son, it's either you're marrying my daughter 20 years? She says, yeah. I would have been out today. Okay, I have a very special tool. It's just a dowel. Sometimes you can't get behind the egg. And if you do, you can drive this in here, but you have a tendency sometimes to mark the egg. So I just use that, that wood to, to push it out. Oh, no, it's it's tight, but it's not, you know, it, it's snug enough that I don't think it's going anywhere, but it's not overly tight as far as I'm concerned. Okay, you saw me push it in just a little bit, and what I did that for was to line up that tailstock. Like I say, at home, I don't worry about that. I know where my lathe is at. Does it ever turn on me? Occasionally. Very seldom, but about the time you're not expecting it. I've had fun over the years with these. The one time it was getting around Easter and we were doing an art show. And my wife says, you gotta take and take some eggs along, it's Easter. And I said, okay, how many you need? She said, oh, give me five dozen. <laughs> so I did. I think I brought 59 of them back, something like that. <laughs> But one of the neat things, there was a guy 
sitting across the aisle from us. This was at Pheasant Run. And uh, he had the personality kind of like a roadkill. <laughs> and he went to the, he had ducks and birds stuff. And he had a pair of mallards. And he went to the washroom. So I put an egg between them. <laughs> and he sat down and he looked at that. <laughs> Never said a word. <laughs> but the little kids used to come along and had all the eggs in a basket. Mister, did you make all those eggs? Nope. I have a pet decoy. <laughs> Well, I, I do sometimes, but normally, normally the ends aren't uh, porous like the rest of the egg is. This one should be easy coming out. Could you be ends more porous because the bend grain? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, when you get the face grain, sometimes the, the pores are long. So that's what I'm talking about. But. <coughs> make something for a wedding or something like that, then I put it on, but other than that, I really don't. Anybody got any questions they'd like to? Yes? about your glue pots, which is the handiest thing you can use. <coughs> yes. Have anything. So, in one of you, you corrected the seal. What, what material are you using to seal? Is it, is it a sealant and you're using it? Is it uh, um, everybody want to hear about this? Uh, this, this is the handiest thing. You okay. Years ago, I decided I hated to have to clean a brush and stuff. So I decided I would take and make a brush in a bottle. So I went and I got one called a mayonnaise jar, you know, big jar. I took an epoxy, got a, a piece of wood on the lid, drilled a hole and put a rat tail brush through it and epoxied <coughs> that in. And it worked fine until one day I grabbed it and it all fell apart. Lacquer thinner dissolved epoxy. <laughs> so I wasn't about to get beat. So 
So I took it all, cleaned it all up, and put it back together with the epoxy. But on the inside, where the only spot that fumes could go through, I put silicone adhesive, which nothing bothered. Now, that big jar had uh, something that I really didn't like. If I was doing something like, we'll say, vermilion or cocobolo, every time I put that brush back in there, that penny started turning red. Okay, so if you've got a pint of $20 a quart, you know, you'd hate to throw it away, and you don't want to put red on maple or anything like that, that is why I went to a smaller jar. I have no problem throwing that away. But I but a pint jar of it, yes, I do. Any other questions? Thank you for letting me have the time.